Um, thank you. Just, just to clarify, I'm a, I'm a trustee of the Jody Matters Trust, which um, um, celebrates and um, rewards um, museums and cultural organisations that um, make their collections accessible for people with disabilities. Um, sorry, let me just get myself sorted out. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, just to keep things going, how many people, put your hands up if you've been to the British Museum. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, we've recently become a partner with SIARC, and I'm going to show you some examples today of the scanning that SIARC's done at the museum. Um, on a personal note, I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to help make this happen. Um, I trained as an artist using photography um, at the Glasgow School of Art, something that's um, come up quite a few times in the last few days. And before joining um, the BM, I worked at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And um, for some of that time, I worked in their photography collection um, that contains many fascinating images of ar architecture and um, heritage from the earliest days of photography. Um, so this project um, gave me the opportunity to rekindle my long-held fascination with the museum and the image how museums use and make images and are the sites of image making. Um, so thank you, Syart, for giving me the opportunity to speak about this. Um, earlier we heard about, um, um, sorry, yesterday we heard about the background to Syart and um, Ben's development of laser scanning technology. Um, as befits a museum professional, I want to take you even further back um, to the 19th century. Because remember, as it says on the wall outside, the past is a prelude. Um, over three days in August, Scott um, and Adam and Ross of Syarch scanned the British Museum's collection of Assyrian reliefs. Um, here's a few images. Um, and actually, just looking at these images, how unsatisfactory taking a photograph along, the corridor, along this corridor is. It's very difficult to, to show these um, reliefs in photography at all, um, which we'll come back to. So, um, as I say, I want to take you back 160 years to when these spectacular objects first arrived in the museum and look at what the state of imaging technology was back then. Um, the first excavation of Assyrian remains in modern-day Iraq were made by the French scientist Paul Emile Botta in 1842, um, he started digging in Nineveh, near the modern city of Mosul, before moving to Khorsabad, where he uncovered the palace of King Sargon II. Um, and then this man, um, Sir Austin Henry Layard, um, had begun excavating um, by 1846 as a private um, initiative financed by the British ambassadors to the Ottoman Empire, Sir Stratford Canning. Um, his first exhibition was so successful that the British Museum took notice and um, persuaded the Treasury um, to take over sponsorship of his excavations and um, gave him sufficient funds to um, continue and um, also to acquire and transport um, his discoveries back to London. Um, Layard excavated the Northwest Palace of Ashurbanipal at Nimrud between 1845 and 1847 and then um, went back to Nineveh and excavated there. Um, the first reliefs arrived in London in June 1847, and, and also the, um, the winged bulls. This is an illustration from the um, illust Illustrated London News. <clears throat> when the objects first came back, they were first displayed in a room on the ground floor, um, and then uh, a special room was opened in 1849, the Nimrud Room, um, a basement space entered by a temporary wooden staircase, and not, not very satisfactory. Um, um, but more and more space was desperately needed and to, dis to store and display these um, massive slabs of stone and the other related um, sculpture. And so the Assyrian galleries were, were, were created um, between the Egyptian sculpture galleries and the Greek sculpture galleries. And there they remain today with very little change. Um, so here's another illustration from a, a, a guidebook of the time. and back to the galleries as they are today. Um, 
In 2014, we've used scanners, 3D scanners, to record these reliefs um, and these winged bulls. Um, but back then, in the 1850s, scanning's forerunner, the, the medium of photography, was actually in its infancy. Um, and as I discovered when I started to read around this, the two mediums, that of photography, um, these, these two methods of exploring and ordering the world, sorry, photography and archaeology, were growing up in the same environment and were clearly related. The main players, the main people organised in these things, um, involved in these things of archaeology, photography, and also interestingly philology, the, the study of um, the ancient languages that were being discovered at this time as well, um, moved in the same social and scholarly circles in London and they were meeting, corresponding and collaborating. And in true Victorian style, some of them were, were moving very fluidly between the different disciplines. Um, it, seems, it seems that um, the connection between photography, museum practice and archaeological practices were almost embedded into the photography's DNA from its very beginning. Um, okay, to illustrate this, I want to talk briefly about two photographers and their relationship with the British Museum, and particularly their relationship with the um, Assyrian artefacts that were arriving at that time. Firstly, um, Sir William Henry Fox Talbot, um, who was one of the inventors of photography. And this is quite interesting, because this is Fox Talbot um, in a daguerreotype, and Dege Louis Daguerre being the other guy who also was inventing it at the same time, so it kind of neatly encapsulates photography at the time. Now, what was special about Fox Talbot's invention of photography is that he invented um, the reproductive method of photography. So he was developing the positive-negative process that delivered multiple prints on paper um, from a single negative in contrast to the daguerreotype, which was an image-making system that made a single image, um, the daguerreotype. Um, in late 1843, Fox Talbot actually visited the museum and demonstrated his process, his discoveries to the museum's trustees, including Charles Fellows, um, who was uh, um, one of the trustees and an archaeologist who was famous for excavating in um, Lycia in modern southern Turkey, and many of, his, many of his, the objects that he excavated are now in the British Museum. And Fox Talbot's aim was to persuade Charles Fellows to use this new medium and to take a camera on his next excavation to record, um, record his archaeology. Um, sadly, um, Fellows wrote a letter after the meeting and said that the science is not yet ripe enough for the use of the rough traveller. It's decided that the process was too complicated. It involved too much, you know, carrying chemicals and, and too much. So he, he didn't. And, and, and this is kind of a watercolour actually done by Fellows, which kind of illustrates this is what... This is how archaeology was being recorded at this time, in, in, in watercolours. Um, and this object, this tomb here, is, is now at the British Museum, and we're going to see it in a minute again. Um, but Talbot wasn't put off. He was fixated on his new technology um, becoming an important tool for archaeologists. And this is evident in his, the first ever photo book, The Pencil of Nature, that he published in 18... Um, I think it says that. 1844. Um, remember, this is a few years before the... Um, I'll just get my dates right. Yes, the reliefs were arriving in 1847, so this is all, all, all very much in the same period. Um, so this is a, um, a book of several plates, with e each plate is accompanied by a short text which emphasised the practical application, implication of these images. And there are archaeological themes throughout this, of collection, documentation, the depiction of site and architecture, capturing things that might no longer be with us. And these run throughout the book. Um, just quoting his Articles of China. The whole cabinet of a virtuoso and collector of old China might be depicted on paper in little more time than it would take him to make a written inventory, describing it in the usual way. Um, here's another image, Boulevards of Paris. Um, and I've, I've put, put the text here. Um, Sometimes inscriptions and dates are found upon the buildings or printed placards most irrelevant are discovered upon their walls. Sometimes a distant dial plate is seen and upon it unconsciously recorded the hour of the day at which the view was taken. 
So he's very much talking about how, how photography can be used as a tool, as almost a kind of a passive tool that you can then come back to and discover things about, about the scenes, about the objects, about the subjects of the photographs um, later. Um, this is a bust of Patroclus, and it's a plaster cast, sorry, it's a, it's a reproduction of a photograph of a plaster cast of an original marble bust held in the British Museum, of course, you guessed it. Um, so it's very photographic in essence. It's a, it's a photograph of a plaster cast of an object. And it, the, it kind of really speaks of the medium and how interestingly also of what was happening at the time. Artifacts based on originals, plaster casts were already in circulation within the homes of the upper classes as tasteful copies, but also in the collections of the museum, of museums such as the V&A. Remember, this was the age of reproduction. The cast courts of the V&A, these opened in 1873, building on decades of the creation of plaster casts in the collection. So, Fox Talbot's choice of, um, sorry, that's slightly early. Um, Fox Talbot's choice of um, subjects in the pencil of nature and his way of talking about the new process tells of a passion for antiquities and the study of ancient languages. His, um, his next book after this was a very small um, um, publication called The Torbotype Applied to Hieroglyphics, which he produced in collaboration with Samuel Birch and others, um, Samuel Birch being the curator and the first serious Egyptologist at the British Museum. Um, so let's look at um, language. I mentioned that the, the people were involved in philology as well. Um, alongside the enormous... Assyrian reliefs coming to the museum. There's also thousands of smaller objects of tablets, cylinders, and other objects um, with cuneiform inscriptions that were coming back to the, the museum. Um, this is the, the black obelisk that was um, acquired by the BM in 1848 and found, uh, discovered by Henry Layard, Austin Henry Layard, in 1846. Um, and um, Edward Hinks, um, a, an Irish scholar in... Um, he, he, he kind of found on this. It's a kind of bit like the, um, the Rosetta Stone. He discovered that um, one, of the, one of the cuneiform inscriptions revealed um, the, the name of, um, sorry, the king of Israel, Jehu, son of Omri, and that connected it to the Bible. Um, so this, this was hugely sensational at the time, and it was in all, all the press, and this object became... And, and still is um, visited hugely by, um, by Bible and, um, and Bible enthusiasts. Um, it's made of black limestone. It was erected as a public monument in um, 825 BC at a time of civil war. And um, it glorifies the achievements of King Shalmaneser um, and his chief minister and lists their military campaigns and the tributes they exacted from their neighbours including camels, monkeys, an elephant, and rhinoceros. And yes, we scanned this, and here is um, a rendering that Adam at Syarch um, has done. And this is the first time I've seen this on a, a, a big screen. It looks, and the, the object's kind of about, ab about as tall as me. Okay, this is another, another Victorian gentleman, Edward Hawkins, who's the keeper um, of the Assyrian objects at the museum. He was the keeper of the Department of Antiquities responsible for them. And um, he'd been corresponding for quite a while with, with Hinks, the, the man who discovered, um, who was, um, who was um, kind of one of the prime movers in, in, um, in uh, um, deciphering cuneiform. And um, they, were, they were talking about how to um, improve... Um, improve this process and um, Hawkins was keen for photographs to be made of all the tablets um, and to help allow Hinks and others to, and to translate them to, you know, so they didn't have to handle the objects um, and also didn't have to do it there in, in the collection and they could circulate them and, and um, these photographs. So it was interesting, this is the kind of first time in, in kind of the museum's documentation you, you see that the justification of of taking and circulating images um, to help scholarship. Um, so Hawkins talked to one of the trustees, Lord Ross, who was 
a scientist and president of the Royal Society. Um, and the trustees um, discussed this at one of their meetings and instructed the museum to hire a photographer. And um, they, to get a recommendation for um, who they should um, approach, they went to this man, who is Sir Charles Wheatstone, um, who's a scientist, who's a scientist and inventor. And he's shown here in a pair of um, stereoscopic photographs um, with his family. Now, again, in, to be in a fitting medium, Charles Wheatstone actually invented um, stereoscopy. He developed the first stereoscopic viewer in 1838. Um, Interestingly, he's, got a, um, he's playing with a little model of a waveform on his desk. He must have been a, a great dad there. You can see. Um, so the first stereoscope that he developed actually used illustrations, um, but the development of photography provided a medium which was more suited um, to 3D. And he worked with this man, Roger Fenton, who was a um, photographer, and they um, collaborated on, on this. Um, and... Um, Wheatstone recommended him to be the um, first British Museum photographer. And so Fenton started, and one of his first um, jobs was to take 3D, yes, 3D images of the museum and its collections. So let's look at some of these. Here's the exterior of the museum, um, the Egyptian sculpture gallery, the Greco-Roman saloon, um, the Lycian Saloon, and if you look just on the right of the image, you can see that tomb that we saw in the watercolour earlier. Um, a reminder that the Natural History Collection was still at the museum at, at, at that point. This is the Mineral Gallery. Um, I couldn't resist the next one, which is the gigantic Irish deer. Um, and I was also delighted to see this, the Assyrian Gallery, which had only been open for a few years. Um, so is that nearly exactly 160 years before um, Sayoc um, were making 3D images in the, in the museum, um, a Victorian gentleman was also doing the same. Um, this is what the viewers for stereoscopes were, were like at that point. Um, on the left is um, Wheatstone's original one, which is slightly clumsy. You have to put your eyes up, and there, there's mirrors, and it's quite a... Um, and then this is the kind of short, the development shortly after of a viewer with, with this um, quite simple um, headset. Again, move forward 160 years, you have Oculus Rift. This is Google Cardboard, um, which you can make very simply from a kit, and you put your iPhone in the top and make a virtual reality viewer. So, again, the Victorians 160 years ago doing what we've taken 160 years to develop. Um, <laughs> As well as experimenting with um, the new 3D technology in galleries, Fenton was also doing what he'd been hired to do, which was to take photographs of the objects. And between 1853 and 1854, he systematically photographed the series of cuneiform tablets um, known as the Kuyunjik collection, um, which is the Kuyunjik being the Turkish name for, um, for Nineveh. Um, he had a special glass um, studio built on the roof of the museum that was as made as a copy of the one he had in his house in North London. Um, and he devised ingenious solutions to kind of keep the, the sunlight out and to, to channel that. Um, this is one of the, um, the first of a series of those Kyunjik tablets. It's kind of numbered K1. Um, and there's also, we've got evidence of some of the original prints um, before they were all cut out and framed. And you can see, if you um, see in the kind of top left of where the objects, um, the damage the missing there's a nail stuck in there and you can see the raking sunlight um, that was help, you know on there and that that um, photographs in the National Med Media Museum in Bradford while the, um, while these are in um, at still in the Middle East department at the British Museum um, so while while then um, Fenton was busy photographing these tablets, Fox Talbot, the inventor of, um, of, of photography, had actually turned to deciphering them. And he, um, it was actually him that provided the initiative um, behind a famous translation competition um, that involved um, Fox Talbot, Edward Hinks, who I mentioned earlier, and two other men. Um, and they independently translated um, a text that was based on this object, which is um, at the BM. 
Um, and they independently translated it, and then there was a, a judging panel, and they all got together and they decided that as the, all four of their translations were suitably similar, um, that the cuneiform had been, um, um, had been cracked. Um, it wasn't all, um, it wasn't, everything wasn't brilliant. This was kind of, um, while this potentially was the renaissance of an amazing partnership of photography at the, at the museum, um, it didn't go as smoothly as planned. I think the museum underestimated the cost of the technology, and Fenton was always fighting with the trustees about money, and he invested a lot of his own money. Um, and um, and it also, I think the, the trustees and the museum couldn't always see the benefits of, of photography. Um, so I want to, just to kind of avoid history repeating itself, I want to talk a bit about why it's so useful to have these scans, uh, have the scans today for, for the museum. Um, as I kind of said at the beginning, it's so incredibly difficult to, to represent these, um, these in um, any other media, that anything that conveys the sense of walking among them. If you look at still images of, um, of scenes, they're like, it's like trying to, it's like trying to describe um, a film like, um, I don't know, a famous film, The Godfather or Casablanca, just by looking at a single cell of the, of, of the film. You know, you need to walk among them. They're, they're time-based. These reliefs are, are time-based media. They were, they were made to walk through, whether you were the courtier, whether you were the king, whether you were the, um, a prisoner, um, as you walked through the royal palace. So recreating that sense of, of, of passage and that sense of atmosphere is, is something that we need to do. Um, and that gives these scans give us the opportunity um, to, to do that, um, whether it's through animated sequences, through uh, augmented reality. And there's so many different levels, because even when you can look at them and walk among them, it's very complicated what's going on. There's a lot of levels. I mean, you look here, it's very difficult to kind of see the figures against the ground. Um, that one's slightly, slightly better. Um, there's a lot of damage in some places, so it's kind of difficult to see what's decoration and, and what's, the, what's the stone. Um, and there's also so many levels that we can look at them at. Um, they, are, they are art. They're how the ancient Assyrians represented the body and movement and, and pain. And, and um, their propaganda, the glorification of the Assyrian monarch being one of the main ingredients that pervades these reliefs. Um, they're an insight into the material culture um, of the um, Assyrians, the clothing, the tools, the weapons, the buildings, the vehicles. Um, and they're also part of a wider architectural scheme. Um, this is, uh, Henry, Austin Henry Layard did this watercolour. Um, it's not completely accurate, but it gives a very good sense. And what's fascinating, I didn't, um, I didn't know, is that um, the, the reliefs that we have are only kind of Above, above the release would have been plaster, which would have been painted with the whole new scene. And none, now none of that, um, none of that survives. Um, but we could reconstruct that in a in a three D um, three D environment. Um, we decided to um, choose one group of um, reliefs, the the Siege of Lachish, um, as the basis um, for a trial to work up um, for you today. And Adam in um, in um, in Scotland has been um, be, been working on this on this um, really hard since the since the scanning in August. Um, um, I won't I won't kind of go into detail about um, about Lakish, except that it's a, um, a um, was an ancient city um, in the Judean hills, about forty kilometres south um, east of Jerusalem, and um, the Assyria it was destroyed by the Assyrian army in um, 701 BC in retaliation for um, a rebellion. And the, the, the city was totally um, destroyed. The buildings were burned to the ground, and the inhabitants um, exiled. And this, and the reliefs at the BM, um, um, they um, show show that they show the, the capture of the city and the exile, the driving out of, of the survivors, and, and that process. And what's interesting is that we the the city of Lakish is you know we've identified where it, it has been identified where it is, and the excavations done there. And you can you can kind of relate the actual archaeological evidence at Lakish, and and the scenes um, here. Um, here's some scanning going on. 
And I think that's using um, an RTEC scanner. I think RTEC are, are here, um, and they've got a stand up there. Um, I always think of it as a bit like a dust buster. You kind of go. Here. <laughs> um, here is the site um, at Lakish. And um, here is the world premiere of the, um, of the scans. They kind of go around um, three, three walls, um, two, kind of two and a half um, walls in, in a gallery. I'm sure these will be made available soon on the, the SciArt site. Yes? And, um, yeah, so, so you can see them on a, on a screen. And what we've done in a, in a second is start to play with the light source so you can um, start to see what, um, yeah, kind of looking at, um, kind of getting a better um, idea of what it'd be like to see actually in, in torchlight, which would have been how you would have seen it. Um, back then, and here we are with some, you can't put, you can't put torches in the British Museum, so you have to do it, <laughs> to do it digitally. Excellent. Okay, um, I'm going to just kind of sum up. Um, the museum, and especially the Assyrian collection, was the scene of some of the earliest uses of image capture technology. Photography, whose inventor was fascinated with archaeology and keen to see his new medium used as a tool for this new discipline. The museum, thanks to its trustees, which included some of the best scientific minds of the time, also saw the potential and brought the technology into the museum. And the museum's first photographer, Roger Fenton, threw himself into the task, investing much of his own time and money as well. And in an amazing precursor of our scans today, he made images specially for viewing in 3D. But the museum's engagement with the medium soon waned, possibly due to lack of funds, and Fenton's employment was ended in 1859, and many of his um, negatives were transferred to the South Kensington Museum, now the v &A. Um, out in the fields, though many archaeological expeditions had cameras with them or worked with local photographers, it was a while before photography came a key recording moment. Um, sorry, became a key recording tool. Um, after Layard and the golden age of Assyrian archaeology, the BM largely focused on buying tablets from dealers and agents rather than having the expense of major expeditions and monumental objects. So it didn't completely grasp the, the, this new technology. Um, tech people here will know of Gartner's hype cycle that charts the typical journey of the maturity adoption and social application of specific technologies. You've got the, the technology trigger, the peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment, leading to the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. As I watched the, the um, SIOT scanners spinning, I thought how the British Museum and the Assyrian objects that so fascinated scholars and public alike 160 years ago was once again the site of the new technology in its early years, some early place on this cycle. But unlike then, I feel that thanks to SIARC, this project marks the start of something that will be sustained. In future, when the BM, as a matter of course, captures 3D scans of every object, storing data that can be used by study for its curators, conservators and scientists, and scholars across the world, and also forms the basis for awe-inspiring interpretive media in the galleries using wearable, portable mobile technology. People look back at this project as the key moment where it all started. So I argue you're the true heirs of these Victorian gentlemen, William Henry Fox Talbot, Roger Fenton, and Charles Wheatstone. Thank you. <laughs>